soil health to me goes from however tall the animals are to 15 or 30 feet below your feet. I mean, it's, it's that, everything that's going on there, all those things are completely connected. You know, if I see a bird fly by, that bird is being powered by the strength and the, the vitality that comes out of that soil. Biggest issues here in the southwest, as you know, is long growing season, ongoing drought, uh, uh, managing uh, diminished water sources, dealing with salinity, uh, trying to find uh, all the different ways that we can use soil health principles, keeping a diversity of plants in our crop rotations, cover crops, keeping the living root throughout the year as much as possible, and uh, having minimal uh, disturbances such as biological, physical, and chemical, and, and integrating grazing where we can. Holding the soil is hugely important because the wind in the spring and well more now throughout the year is just so harsh that wind erosion is terrible and just holding that dirt that we've worked hard for is important. Yeah, the sand dunes came to be here for a reason and it's prevailing southwest wind and you know highly sandy soil and so we're just trying not to add to that any too more than we have to. But. You know, the San Luis Valley is a, is a place where it's always had a high water table and now that's going away because of industrialized agriculture and, and the way we've used the aquifer and we're trying to deal with that. In the meantime, you know, how, how are we going to survive? The water issue has really made us have to stop and think because the things we do today impacts tomorrow. And my job as a, as a rancher is to keep the soil covered to nurture the plants. I drive through the valley back and forth. I'm 35 miles from here to where I have cattle in the summer and every day I drive through that bare soil. And I'm really disheartened by it, to tell you the truth. It does, it's, a, it's not good enough. You know, that lack of soil will destroy this valley and this community eventually. My family's been here since 1893 and um, I'm the third generation, and so we've been on this piece of ground or around here for a long time. But what you see right here is a, it's a, it's a native uh, uh, inland meadow. It's basically, it's, it's almost a wetland, but not really. Uh, it's irrigated with groundwater, this particular place. It was part of the old alluvium of Swatch Creek at one time, so the, the soils and the, the, you know, the, the kind of habitat that is here is, is conducive to that kind of production. One of the things we love about our meadow is that it's incredibly diverse. And so that's part of its biological resiliency is no matter what the year does, something can grow. Something can grow out there that cattle can eat. Um, and that's because of land practices that George has been doing since the 1980s. Our advantage here in the San Luis Valley is that it's a very arid, dry, uh, sort of step environment. So we don't really need to bale hay and put it in a shed. Uh, and I realized a long time ago when I was trying to think about buying a new baler and some new haying equipment, how much that was going to cost. And I got to thinking, why do I need that? That's the way everybody does it, I know. And I grew up putting up hay all summer and feeding it out all winter. But I, I started to question that because it, it didn't really seem like it was maybe necessary because my grandfather didn't have all that and he raised stock and succeeded. George, years, years and years and years ago, was one of the, the people who was really looking at holistic management in a careful way and starting to learn about ecosystem processes. And when the language of soil health eventually developed, they dovetail real well with what Alan Savory and, and his contemporaries were talking about with ecosystem processes. 
specific to like the practice of holistic management. If you really truly practice it, I think it builds resilience because you know what you want your quality of life to be, you know what you want those, those, those things to be, but you don't necessarily attach that to a particular way it has to manifest. It reminds you that it's important to sort of stay diverse in your thinking and to um, be able to sort of consider how, how can your knowledge, how can your skills um, morph and shift as that's required. To me, it's, it's, all, it's everything. There's no, you can't really separate it very much. It's all, all works together, in, including me. And so we're, we're just part of that zone of life. That's what soil health means to me. <laughs> How was your uh, visit with Aaron? It was great. Good. Yeah, they're, they're, if I was going to be a farmer, that's the kind of farmer I'd like to be. <laughs> <laughs> my my name's Lyle Nissen, and this is our farm here. Um, I'm the third generation. This is my daughter Erin. She's the fourth generation. Um, my granddad bought this property by paying up the back taxes right after the Depression in about 1938. Um, and we've survived through the tail end of the Dust Bowl and the dry times of the 50s. It was really dry in this country. And again, in the 70s, it was dry. And now we're in another dry part that's uh, started in 2002. And we thought it'd be kind of over and it's, it's not over yet. So <laughs> we're still <clears throat> learning and, and responding to what happens you know, constantly. In today's world, everything has to produce for the water we put into it. And that's an dis ongoing discussion that we have more and more so is, are we getting the most bang for our buck of, out of that water? Because to our operation, the water is more critical and harder to come by than cash. You know, you can borrow all the money you want, but water is the key. Where we're at is really sandy, and so the water that we can get out of the well is much more limited, just because it flows in so slowly versus when you go west, as you progressively go west, the wells get better. And so that was the other thing that impacted our farm so much is after 2002, we lost about 50% of the pumping capacity of our wells. That is part of the subdistrict is that we pay for every acre foot that we pump. So the, that is a huge value that, yeah, they have to be able to pay for themselves that way. I would say that in regards to the soil health and what we're doing, it's directly linked to potatoes. Because we stretched out our rotation and we're planting more cover crops and in implementing different things, then the quality and our yields have gone up. We've seen a direct improvement because potatoes are a high disturbance crop, which potatoes are very hard on soil. We really try and focus and watch about like the fungi and all the mycorrhizal activity in the soil. And anytime you run potato equipment through, you disturb all those communities. So having the longer rotation allows those to kind of build back up. And we've really played with kind of quasi no-till stuff. And, you know, we drill right into grain stubble and things like that. And part of potato harvest is how much dirt you can carry up the chain as you pull the potato out. And some of our older fields that have been in those systems carried the dirt just holds together better and handles moisture better. And you can directly see it compared to newer fields that are still coming in online in the process. That just, it's just sand. And it has been an evolution. You know, we've learned some things and tried some things that were wrong and kind of come back to some things and change. And, and that's what keeps me interested is, you know, there's something new that we're gonna try next year, you know, and let's see if that works. You know? And we're always testing something. something. <laughs> Too much. Too much. <laughs> I think, people are seeing that these practices have a benefit to the to profit. And so there's some people that are doing some things to try and improve that way. Dad said it quite a bit that the valley's unique in that it's kind of sort of a giant research farm. If something's good or something's really bad, the word gets out across the valley quickly. <laughs> and the bad, I guess, maybe spreads a little quicker sometimes. But so it is, it is good that way. How is it that ranchers in the San Luis Valley are, 
or some ranchers at least are thinking about this side or the other because George grew up with a lot of people who, who are in, still in that, in that world. And I'm working more with croppers and people who, who are still tilling or wondering about soil health now and, and can we give out less tillage and, and just seeing uh, with, can we bring these worlds back together that, that were created together but somehow torn apart. How can we have more of these meaningful conversations about soil and the health in the soil and can that lead to good food and nutrient density and, and the things that we'd really like our community to experience. All folks that have been doing this for any length of time, they're all students of soil health. Nobody will tell you that they've mastered every detail, but we're, in the, we're on the journey of uh, leveraging and finding out who has the best knowledge, the best technique, the best uh, you know, practice and what has worked, what hasn't. And so we're, it's an ongoing process. And, and so when I started working with a lot of farmers, uh, what I realized is that uh, the soil health, health has application in every kind of cropping system, whether you're grazing on dry land or irrigated pastures or you're growing vineyards, orchards or growing vegetables. And uh, so that has been my interest in bringing that into the soil health division and partnerships is to say, hey, uh, the more people know about soil health, the better off they're gonna be. It's gonna take time, but uh, the answers lie in having a healthy soil.